Well, good morning and uh, welcome to our webinar this morning. I'm delighted to welcome everybody and delighted to welcome our speakers, uh, David Belbin and David Bransbury. Um, in this webinar, we're going to be looking at the extension uh, to the coronavirus job retention scheme that was announced on Friday by uh, Rishi Sunak and also the extension to the self-employed support scheme. Um, we will have time for questions, uh, so can I suggest uh, to all participants that you use the Q&A uh, on your Zoom to toolbar to post any questions that you would like um, answered and we'll do our best to, uh, to get through all of those before the end of our uh, webinar today. Um, for any questions that we don't get to answer, we will come back to individuals on a one-to-one -one basis afterwards. Uh, but use the Q&A panel and we'll take all of the questions at the end of the, uh, the two presentations. So uh, let's get started and we start with David Belbin covering the uh, coronavirus job retention scheme and the extension to that. So over to you, David. Good morning. So just to uh, lay the foundation for what the changes are going to be, we need to think uh, first about what that job retention scheme looks like currently so uh, just before the uh, we were all told to stay at home and protect the NHS uh, these measures came in which was very good news really uh, it's the flagship of the government measure to support the economic fallout from the coronavirus so since March schemes allowed employers to furlough employees keeping them on the payroll while requiring that they carry out no work for the employer, although they can do training. Employers have been able to claim a grant worth up to 80% of their usual wages, capped at two and a half thousand pounds a month, plus the employer national insurance contributions and the standard automatic uh, auto enrolment pension contributions. But there's a series of changes coming in the coming weeks, and that's the purpose of. Uh, this morning. It's going to be changes in the way the scheme operates and who can be furloughed and the work they can undertake while furloughed. Firstly, that scheme is going to close to new entrants from the 10th of June because after the 30th of June, employers will be unable to furlough employees who've not previously been furloughed for a full three weeks. Remember at the moment, it's a furlough for three week period. And at the same time, those employers will not be able to furlough more employees in a claim period than the maximum number of employees claimed for under the scheme in its current form. So your team members, if you're furloughing them, have to be on that furlough list by the 10th of June. The second change, and I think very, very welcome, is that from 1st of July, employers will be able to bring back furloughed employees on a part-time basis under a system of flexible furlough. So they can work for any amount of time and on any shift pattern with you as employers still able to claim for hours not worked that a furloughed employee otherwise would work. Furthermore, the minimum claim period will be one week. So we've got, instead of a three week period, we've got a one week period and we've got more flexibility. And if those employees are working for you, you as the employer will have to pay their cost. But the rest of the time that the employee is furloughed, the government will still pick up up to that two and a half thousand pounds a month or proportion thereof, um, the national insurance and pension contributions that that would attract. And then from 1st of August, the value of these grants is going to start tapering down. So from 1st of August, they'll no longer cover the cost of employer national insurance contributions and pension contributions with those costs being passed to the employers that 
could be about 5%, they reckon. But those grants will still cover 80% of an employee's usual wages up to a cap of £2,500 a month. And then from 1st of September, the value of the CJRS grants will fall uh, to 70% of the usual wages, which means that if you have an employee furloughed, they still remain entitled to receive 80% of their usual wages, capped at £2,500, but you'll be paying 10% of that 80%. So, and you'll have the national insurance and pension contributions. And then on the 1st of October, there's going to be a further 10% reduction. So the, the government grant will fall to 60% of furloughed employees' usual wages. But as with September, the, the employees will remain entitled to 80% of their usual wages up to that cap of two and a half thousand pounds a month. So the employers are going to contribute 20% of the furloughed employees' usual salary. Now, it's going to stop on at the end of October, and it won't be possible to claim a grant in respect to furloughed employees thereafter. So we're going to have something of a cliff edge, because on the uh, 31st of uh, October, an employer would have been receiving uh, support for 60% of uh, that employer's employees' wages, you know, and the employer were liable for just 20%, which that 80% minimum. So there's a five-fold increase in cost with all the national insurance and contribu pension contributions uh, that go with that. And at that point, employers are gonna have to decide <clears throat> whether they are gonna bring the furloughed employees back to work as previously or renegotiate their contract or unfortunately make them redundant. So there's a few things you need to think about and do with your employees. If you have employees on furlough, you don't actually need to change anything until August and then you'll need to begin meeting the cost of an employer national insurance contributions and those pension contributions. You don't need to say anything to them if they're staying on full furlough. But it will be open to you to bring those employees back on a part-time basis from 1st of July, while still claiming a grant in respect to any of their usual hours that they're not working. And that arrangement will then remain in place until the close of the scheme in October. But you're gonna to need to consult with your employees if you're going to move them on to flexible furlough. So you're going to need to give them a new flexible furlough agreement in writing, setting out the new working arrangements. And you're going to need to start recording the number of hours worked by that furloughed employee and the number of hours they would usually work. So there'll be tweaks made to the reporting of the on the furlough scheme now one of the uh, questions we as employers uh, and concerns that we have as employers is what happens if our employees have to self-isolate as a result of some contact tracing and we've got to be ready that any one of a number of our employees uh, could be required to self-isolate, uh, especially if one employee from a workplace uh, tests positive uh, for coronavirus. So you've got to be aware of those arrangements concerning statutory sick pay and self-isolation. The changes uh, to the regulations that were implemented after the outbreak hit mean that self-isolating employees are entitled to SSP from the first day of absence if they cannot work from home. And employers can claim a grant to cover the cost of SSP resulting from coronavirus for up to two weeks per employee. And where a self-isolating employee does not have symptoms and so is otherwise fit to work and can work from home, 
they should continue to do so on full pay. Of course, it's, it is open to an employer to uh, subsidise the minimum SSP payment, uh, but that is there. Okay, that's all I want to say on the job retention scheme. It's um, without that, I think so many companies would have gone to the wall. And but it's going to be difficult as we come back, and there's still going to be many companies without sources of income that are going to have to start funding employee costs and that's going to be very hard for them. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm going to do talk about the self-employment income support scheme, um, or SEISS. So the scheme was announced by the Chancellor in March. It was a run for initial period until the end of May. Uh, the scheme in its current form provides a taxable grant equivalent to 80% of a self-employment individuals and, and partnerships average trade profits for three months, capped at £7,500 in total and paid in a single instalment. And lots of our clients are going through and claiming it as we speak. Uh, the scheme opened for applications on the 13th of May and uh, applications for the current round, this is a new thing, will close on the 13th of July. So that's the key date, 13th of July. If you don't claim by then, it closes. So far, two and a half million claims have been made, totaling £6.8 million. Oh. Uh, now, so the Chancellor has now, now announced a new round of funding going forward. So what's happening now? The Chancellor has announced a second and final grant for self-employed individuals. This time it's worth 70% of their average trading profits for a three month period, capped at £6,570 and paid in a single instalment. So who is eligible? It's the same people. So the, the eligibility credit is the same for the second round as the first. Uh, a self-employed person must have trading profits of no more than 50,000 and must receive the majority of their income from self-employment. They can't have large dividends and salaries, etc., or rental profits. Other all cases where I've dealt with that haven't had it. The trade of profits will either be the average of the last three years or where you only just started, it's the average um, trading profits in 2018-19 but you must have submitted a self-assessment tax return in 2018-19 and have that self-employment income on there. People who pay themselves a salary and dividends through their own company, um, that will they, not be, they will not be eligible for the scheme, but could be eligible for the job retention uh, fallout scheme if they use PAYE. Uh, can I ever apply if a work and income is not reduced? No, you have to confirm your business has been adversely affected uh, by the coronavirus when you apply, but there is no, um, there is no um, a definition of adversely affected. So one person's adversely is affected is somebody else is not, but uh, I'd, I would still go for it. Do you have need to have to apply for the first round of funding if you haven't applied for the second. Well, it looks at the legislation, the, the details we got, no. So there's no requirement to be made a claim for the first round of funding and to be eligible for the second, which seems quite strange to me, but that's that. Uh, am I restricted? Am I... Um, uh, uh, Am I um, restricted in what I can do if I claim under the SSEISS scheme? Well, actually, and different to uh, the other scheme, there's the employee scheme. You can do like you do what you want. You can carry on working for yourself. You can um, uh, you can begin a new trade, take on a job. No, it's all you can do what you like. So, uh, how can I claim? when the applications will be the same system, but they open up in August. So that's why they're gonna have shut one scheme in July and open up the new scheme in August. 
and the amount, uh, well, a further details on this are meant to be on 12th of June. And he said, this is it. Uh, it seems very unlikely that the Chancellor will allow another scheme. This is it. So like the other scheme, you're going to be paid for three months, which is only up to the end of August. And that's it. Thank you. Right, I can see us. Yeah, Hi. question. Go on. Yeah, we have some questions. Thank you. So um, this is your opportunity now as, uh, as our audience to ask uh, any questions that you might have um, about the uh, retention scheme, furlough uh, and around the self-employed scheme. Uh, we do have some questions in already, so I'm just going to um, uh, push those over initially to you, uh, David Belby. So this is a question from Helen. Um, can an employer leave a staff member on the reduced amount of furlough and not take uh, that member back part time? Or does the employer need to take each member back part time for the furlough to make up the remaining part of the original salary? Right. I think there's two, there's two parts to that uh, question, really. You don't have to take your employees back part time. But um, and indeed, it's been open to the employer to subsidise the government effectively and top up back to 100% of the salary at, all the time anyway. But um, in terms of uh, taking an employee back part time, uh, just so that they can uh, make up the remaining part of the original salary, you, ju you just don't have to do that. Um, it's you, you've got flexibility and um, so somebody can either work uh, from home or they can't home. Okay. Okay and we have another question here. Um, can I bring back a staff member part-time and then if they're not needed sort of three weeks down the line again put them back on full furlough? Uh, if they've been on furlough and the question says can I bring back a staff member so they have been on furlough yes you, you can bring them back part-time and then if they're not needed you can put them back on furlough um, if that's any time after 1st of August you're still going to be making some contributions but you're going to get a, a significant subsidy so that's still very attractive I think for employers under the new scheme, you need to have on, on furlough for at least a week, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Under the, the current scheme, it's three weeks. So. Mm. Okay. And uh, this is one uh, for you, David Bransbury. Uh, about this self-employed scheme, am I likely to be audited sort of further down the line and asked to pay the grant back if my accounts show that I've not been affected in my trading over this period? There's a strange thing when you do the SIS claim, it says the list of things you need to have after you've claimed. And it says you need to have accounts that show the turnover down. But um, it's, uh, it doesn't say why. And it's not on the legislation, it's just on the revenue screams after you've claimed. And, and I would argue, I've, I've got one client in particular who, who, who has, has up to the run up to the, um, the change of system um, that, that closed down, he was doing very well. And he's got, he's got an, um, a May year end and, and his May year end might be up from last year, but it's that, those two months certainly were down, absolutely were down. So it's it's is a is a strange thing, and and I don't know how the revenue will, whether this and the, and on an individual basis, I would argue that the, you could always justify for different things. If you if if your turnover is ten thousand pounds a month and it is ten thousand pounds a month it, all the time, then then you, we it's something we, the client and us have got to discuss and 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 look at. But I haven't seen anything that. Uh, but uh, uh, give the money back. Okay. okay. Um, and then I, I've got one final question here um, about furlough payments and whether you can use them as part of, uh, if you're going to make people redundant, whether you can use the furlough payments as part of the 
the notice period payment that you have to make to that employee? I don't see uh, why you wouldn't be able to do that. So if you, if you, some people will require 12 weeks notice um, or up to 12 weeks notice. Um, if the furlough scheme is in place, um, then there's, they would be employed up until the point of redundancy. So you can claim the uh, job retention scheme subsidy. Um, but you, you wouldn't be able to, if you, if, you, if you had somebody on furlough to the end of August, say, and then yeah. you had said you had to give 12 weeks notice, the 12 weeks notice will start at the end of August. Yeah. It wouldn't start, just because someone's on furlough, they're not expected, if that's not an automatic expect, expectation, that that they're on they're on potential redundancy so it's absolutely is that yeah furlough scheme fine then then redundancy if you have to give 12 weeks or um, yeah 12 weeks redundancy period then that notice will start at the end of august yeah so that so 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 what we're saying is that if if you've um if an employer's made that decision what you can't do is backdate a furlough period and say it's part of your statutory uh, notice okay. because furlough doesn't furlough doesn't mean somebody's going to be made redundant that is a separate decision okay. um oh, another question here and um, can a director put themselves on furlough yes but they can't do any work which will generate income for the company now or in the future so they can chasing old debtors they can update their books and records but uh they certainly can't be doing work which either raise invoices now or the future uh i have had a bone of contention on updating your website if you're updating your website and it's just and it's just an advertising page i think it's okay but if that website is a is a portal that you sell goods through then I would argue that is something that will generate you income rather than just advertising. So that's, that's yeah, furlough, you can, directors can be furloughed, but you still can't be, you can't be working. And are there a dividend payments allowable against the furlough? Or is it purely Sadly, absolutely not. And this, this is regularly mentioned to the politicians and how there's a, the thing we've paid all these taxes on dividends and we're not getting anything for it and mm. and and the the, the the politicians are saying okay fine well yeah so no these are some pretty blunt rules um where they come down so for instance with the uh seiss if you've got um a husband and wife and they're in partnership and um their profits of average for the last couple of years, um, uh, forty-eight thousand pounds. They're each going to be entitled to um, the uh, the grant. If you had a individual whose profits of average fifty-two thousand pounds and is the sole breadwinner in the household, um, he won't get anything. It's yeah. as hard as that, and. You know, we see that, we see that with the dividends and oh, many, many uh, directors uh, who are, take what has been um, the most efficient way to extract money out of uh, their company, a small salary, pay a, a small amount of national insurance, and then take the rest out by way of dividend. Mm. This is hurting them. Yeah. And I fully understand that. Okay. We've had a question on the Q&A. Mm. So uh, this might be one for the employment lawyer, uh, employment lawyer, I'm not quite sure if we can answer this, but uh, if someone is on probation period and furlough, does it automatically mean their probation period is extended until they return back to work? Uh, I think that might be above my pay grade, um, <laughs> which means that you will need a, an employment lawyer. Yeah, I would, I would have thought you would extend it because you, as, as an employer, somebody's on a probation period because you want to see how they are going to work and this is a unusual circumstance you'd be perfectly entitled to 
extend a probation period. Um, and the employee should understand that. Um, if, if they've done sufficient work to prove to you inside that probation period that they're the right person for the job when you get going again, uh, but they have been furloughed because you can't support a trainee or whatever, um, then, then, yeah, you don't need to extend it. I, I think it's between the employer and the employee, but an employer who's had somebody there for five minutes, but fortunately before the 1st of March, um, and then and has put them on furlough, they're just not going to know what, how yep. good they are. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's all of our, our questions. Um, so thank you, David. Thank you, David. Um, I thank hope you, everybody's uh, got, to, got what they wanted out of this webinar. Um, thank you very much for attending. And there will be a recorded version of the webinar available on the Clements Hawkins website uh, at the end of today. And we will send you a quick email just to let you know where to find that. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.